All right. Now, <clears throat> let's pick this back up. We're going to start back in 1 Corinthians 2. And I'm going to read through this and try not to comment too much on it because it is scripture and you can, it, it says what it says. So, he says, <clears throat> when I came, well, we start in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Hear that? Our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now we've talked about this. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now notice, we hear that quoted all the time. But now watch what Paul says. But God hath revealed them. You hear that? In other words, we can't say that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard anymore. See, we can't say that. We do that time. And we always try to do it in a way of, well, you know, nobody knows what God's going to do. You know, there's things, His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Okay, if that's true for you, you need to get saved. If your ways are not God's ways, you are not saved. You understand? So you can't sit there and hide behind that and go, well, you know, God's ways are mysterious, not to people that know Him. His ways are not mysterious to people that know Him. <clears throat> and here he said, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. Now notice, neither have entered into the heart of man. Now what do we say? Aren't we born again? Have, aren't you a new creation? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God. So in your heart is not these evil things. It's so funny. I just heard this the other day. Somebody quoted. I hadn't heard it in a long time. <clears throat> but I heard somebody say, well, you know, the heart is wicked above all, all things. You know, it's a, how, how wicked the heart is. Yeah, for an unborn again person. Not for the saved person. There's a change. Now, you may, your mind still may be messed up. But your heart, if you're truly born again, it's changed. Your heart is not wicked. Amen? You got to realize something happened when you got born again. It wasn't just a mere, you know, verbal agreement. Something happened. Something took place. You became new. Believe in that change. Believe in that difference. That, one of the reasons you say, well, I haven't changed that much. That's because you haven't believed in the change that happened on the inside. When you start recognizing, that's when Paul said, listen, you have to reckon yourself dead. Why? Because you're, you're looking at this here, you know, and you're listening to you, and there's things you say and do and all that kind of stuff. But in your heart, if you're truly changed, you're going to reckon yourself dead, and then you're going to start living like Christ. Now, he says here, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Revealed them what? The things that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard. The things that has not, now watch, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Now, under the old covenant, that was true. Those things had not been revealed. Those things had not been shown to people. But under the new covenant, those things are now revealed. Those things, God hath revealed them to us by his spirit. The things that God has prepared, the things that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard, things that I hadn't entered the heart of man, those things have now been, been, been given to us. They have been revealed to us. So don't make it sound like God's hiding something from you. There's books out there. It's, it's funny. I look at these books. I see what's going on in the church. And they talk about the God who hides himself. You know, it's like divine hide and seek. You've got to go find God. You've got to seek God. God said there's none that seeks after him. It said everybody's gone their own way. 
Everybody's living their own merry life and they're just going about their merry days, you know. And God said, no, no, he's seeking me. He said, I've been seeking. Jesus said, I've come to seek those which were lost. Amen. So everything is back. God's not playing hide and seek with you. God's not trying to hide from you. If God wanted to hide from us, all he had to do was not send Jesus. You know, if you read, the last book in the Bible is the book of the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's not the book of the hidden. It's the book of the revealing. It's amazing. God is doing everything he can to reveal. He revealed himself totally in Jesus, perfectly and completely in Jesus. And yet we still want to go back and say, well, God's hiding himself. God's, and you know where they get? They get it from the Old Testament. They can't preach that out of the New because right? in the new, God did not hide himself. And, and even Philip had a hard time with this because Philip was still an old covenant Christian. Philip, the disciple. He said, Lord, he, Jesus said, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, no, no. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? In other words, I perfectly reveal God to you. I've shown you what God is like. And yet we want to fall back and we, we are so far from just pure scripture just script, just read it you don't have to you know this secretly means this and you know read between the lines there's nothing between the lines just believe it act like it's true he says here <clears throat> god hath revealed them verse 10 unto us by his spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of God the, the, the spirit that searches the deep things of God that's the spirit that lives in you the deep thing now is God hiding himself from himself no of course not and those deep things that the spirit searches out and reveals and shows and, and, and brings to us he's doing that for a purpose to reveal to you do you think the spirit needs to know the things of God no you need him and God gave you his spirit Matter of fact, it even says in Galatians, he gave you his spirit so that we can know these things, right? The things that were freely given to us. Now, he says, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. See, the spirit you have is of God. It's not a worldly spirit. It's not another spirit. It's the spirit of the living God. It's his spirit. And you have that. And he said, we have the spirit of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. There it is. Why do you have the spirit? So you can know the things. Not so he can hide them from you. If God was going to hide them, he's not going to hide them from you. you know, if, if the world didn't understand him, he said, the world doesn't know me. They're not going to know you. Well, why don't they know him? Because they're natural. And the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because the natural mind, the carnal mind, is enmity against God. It can't get it. It doesn't understand it. But it, that's not you. That's the world. You're not like the world. You understand the things of God. It's in you. You have the Spirit of God. He's your tutor. He's your, 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 your teacher, your instructor. And his whole job is to keep teaching you to reveal what God put in you. God put it in you, and that's the Holy Spirit's job to bring those things out. Right? Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, and, and all of that, he, spoke, he said he will take a mind and show it to you. His job is to teach you not, not to take things somewhere out there and bring them in, but to take what's in you and bring it out. He said that a, a good scribe or a good student brings out of the good treasure of his heart, good things, right? Things old and new. In other words, you look at some of the old things, you compare with the new, and you learn from the old and the new. But he brings these things out, and he says if he's well-trained, then he will bring these things out and be able to reveal them. Well, the Holy Spirit is well-trained. The Holy Spirit knows it, and he brings these things out of you. He doesn't say he's going to bring them from somewhere else and give them to you. He says he will bring them out of you. You've got to know and believe in the Spirit of God that lives in you that abides in you, that you don't have to go chasing things. Amen. That you've got it. Now you just got to walk in it. Amen? Amen? You know, it's amazing if, if you just realize who you are. It's amazing. And you say, but you don't know me. I don't have to. I know God. 
And, and he knows you. And the beauty of it is, he said, you know what? I'll take anybody. You just turn to me out and, and you, you turn to him and he will come inside to you and live in you and abide in you. And he said, if my words live in you and dwell in you, I'll live in you and dwell in you. Well, well of course he lives in you, but you, his word has to dwell in you. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So his word dwells in you. And that's what the Holy Spirit uses to bring out of you. Now, he's there. But if you don't know what the Word of God says, then you don't know what is in you. In James, it talks about the man that looks into the perfect law of liberty. And that perfect law of liberty, he's talking about that perfect law of liberty is the Bible. That's what he says. And he says that a man that looks into the perfect law of liberty, and then he's, he hears the Word, but he forgets the Word. And he's not a doer of the Word. He says that man is a forgetful hearer. And that man is like a person who looks at himself in a mirror and when he walks away, he forgets what manner of man he is. In other words, he looks in the mirror and when he walks off, he forgets what he looks like. Now, isn't it funny? Think about this. Isn't it funny that James compared the Word of God to a mirror, not to a painting? Because we say, you know, you look at this Word, what is this? Well, this is Jesus you know, Jesus was the Word made flesh. So this is about Jesus. Jesus is every verse in this Bible perfectly personified. Isn't that right? So if, we're gonna, if they're going to talk about us looking at this perfect law of liberty, it should say we're looking at a portrait of Jesus. Right? I mean, that's what you would think. But he didn't ever said that. He said it's like a man looking at a mirror. Now when you look in the mirror, whose face do you see? Yours. Right? Well, the funny thing is, when you look in this mirror, you're looking at you. But you know who's looking back at you? Jesus. Why? Because that's who you look like. That's who you are. That's who you're going to grow up to be. That we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Ephesians 4, 13 through 15. Amen? That's who you are. So when you look at this, you're not just looking at Jesus. You're looking at you. You say, okay, who am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at Jesus. Yeah, but... Are you looking at you or are you looking at Jesus? Yeah. Why? No longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. What is this mystery? That Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. That's what we've been talking about. See, that's why many of you, to many of you, it's still a mystery. You know he lives there, but you don't know what he's doing there. And, and you think he's just there so that whenever God comes by and checks, he finds him there and then you can go to heaven. And that's not why he's there, okay? He's there so that Jesus can be Jesus here, through you. But the best way for Jesus to be Jesus is for you to get out of the way. And the way you get out of the way is you die. And then, but now, it's no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. Yet, now listen to this. But the life that you now live, you live after the faith of the Son of God. Right? So you're still living a life even though it's not you living the life. It, well, there was called the great exchange. You know, we always hear it. Jesus came down and became what we were so that we might be what he is. Well, it goes even further than that. He came, now, think about this. You want to talk science fiction. You know, think about this. It's as if, it's more than as if, it is. Okay? It's not as if, it is. Jesus came down, took on the form of a person. Whenever he, he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised, you were raised. Right? He ascended. And when he ascended, he went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Right? Now, where are you? Seated with him. So then he took you with him. Right? But now, the thing is, it's so funny because it's as if he said, here's what we're going to do. I need your body. So I'm going to take you with me to heaven and then we're going to sit down at the right hand of the Father and by the Spirit I'm going to come back and live in your body. And you're going to become my body. And now I'm going to walk around on this earth in your body. So it's no longer you that's here, you're there. See, you're there and he's here. But yet we're here and he's there. You say, you say well that's confusing. I know it's got the devil all confused. <laughs> <laughs> It's got him all messed up. Okay? But that's the way this is. 
It's like mercury, you know, trying to pick up mercury, you know, how you can't grab a hold of it. It's kind of like that. The devil never can quite put his finger on who you are. Is this you or is this Jesus? Is it Jesus or is it you? And if you answer correctly, he still won't know. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So you just start to walk like Jesus. And if you walk like him and talk like him, for all the devil knows, you're him. Yep, that's right. He can't tell the difference. Right? I already told you the other day. Was it the other day? I think it was the other day. We were talking about the three wise men. Was that yesterday or was it this morning? It's all, it all blends. It's just... <laughs> You know, how three wise men can find Jesus and the devil couldn't. Right? It shows that, like I said, that the devil's not near as sharp as most people think he is. He did the same thing with Moses. Couldn't find him. Tried to kill him. Still couldn't do it. So, you need to realize this is who you are. Just start acting like it. You know you want to. Right? You know that's what you were born for. So, and you say, well, yeah, but I got people around me that won't ever let me forget my past. Then get away from them. <laughs> you need a whole new bunch of friends. Amen? Amen? Come on. Friend, I'm telling you, friendship is, if friends are going to keep you from being who God called you to be, they're not your friends. You need to get some new friends. Amen. For the most part, friendship is way overrated. Right? I'd rather have friendship with God. Amen. You know, you can always find other friends. He says, in verse, where are we at? Verse 14. Yeah, no, 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Hear that? Well, you shouldn't judge. Okay, right and wrong. Right here it says if you're spiritual, you can judge all things. However, it does not say you can judge all people. It says things. Right? You can judge actions. You can judge situations. Just don't judge people. Right? Now you can say, you know, people that do that don't go to heaven. You can, you can say that because Paul said that. He said, don't you know that people that do these things, and he gave a list, he said, don't you know that they will not inherit the kingdom of God? He did, but he didn't say, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because you don't pronounce judgment. That's not up to you yet. Right? But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Now that's an Old Testament verse he's quoting again. But notice he says, but we have the mind of Christ. You notice he didn't say we're going to get the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Where is the mind of Christ? Well, it's the mind of the Spirit. You have the mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit in two places. Here in your belly, in your spirit, you know what I'm talking about, in your spirit, and in this book. This book is the mind of Christ. Right? And what's in your spirit matches what's in this book. The only place that you have any confusion about it or question about it is in your head. And the only part of your head that has a question about it is the unrenewed part of your mind. And the more your mind is renewed to the Word, Romans 12 says, then you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Yeah. Right? And so when you can prove the will of God by the Word of God, then that means your mind is renewed. Yeah. That's how all that works together. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to read through, uh, we're on page 47. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He has made us, underline made, made us accepted in the Beloved. God made you accepted. Right? There were probably some of the Beloved that didn't want you, but God said, Nope, you are going to accept Him. Yeah. Right? He made you accepted. There wasn't any choice about it. And you didn't attain acceptance. He made you accepted. In whom... We have, notice not what we're going to have, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein, in the riches of His grace, He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You hear that? He has abounded toward us. In other words, he, you know, when it, when it says abounded, I don't know why, but it's just the wording, I guess. When I see, when it says he has, he has abounded toward us. I always think, I was, we used to raise Dobermans when I was a kid. My dad was a policeman. 
We used to raise Doberman Pinschers, and they were always, especially then I was really small, and they were really big. And we had one that weighed, weighed 125 pounds. A huge Doberman. Legs was like this when he walked, you know? Big dog. And it was so funny because we had a huge yard with a eight foot hurricane chain link fence around it. And that dog would be in the corner and you step on the front porch and you call for him. And this dog would run, you know, a bound toward us, <laughs> okay? We'd say he'd come bounding towards you, you know? I mean, it would take like, it was across the yard, but it would take like three, you know, leaps. <laughs> and he was there. And it was just like, boom, boom. And the thing was, he didn't have any plans of stopping when he got to you. <laughs> you know He's just like, he'd just run right over you. Because he, once he got all that mass going, it was hard to put the brakes on it. And every time I read this, I think of that. And it says here that God came abounding toward us. And it's almost like, here it comes, whoa, it just get, you just get overwhelmed with his wisdom, prudence, grace. I mean, it's like a tidal wave. It just, over, just overflows you. And if you ever, see, it's not enough to hear this. You've got to meditate on this. And what I mean meditate is, you've got to think about it. This has to become a purpose in you. It has to become a, 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 you know, a priority. You have to get to a place where you think about this. That's one of the great things about my job. I get to travel across the country. I drive sometimes 10, 12, 14 hours in a day. I'll start early in the morning, drive some, usually, you know, sometimes till 10 o'clock at night before I pull into a motel somewhere. And it's awesome because I, I get, a lot of times I take a lot of guys with me on the road. Like this time we brought up two different vehicles and we had some people in the car with me. But many times I go by myself. And it's awesome because I get to spend like 10 hours doing nothing. It's funny, I put in a CD, like a worship CD or even a teaching CD, and I'll turn it on and sometimes it'll be something and I'll listen to like two minutes and then if, I'm, if it's one of mine or whoever it is, they'll say something. And all of a sudden it's like, boom, cut it off. And I'll spend the next 10 hours thinking about that. And just turn it over my mind. Wow, that means this. And this comes into this. And I don't get that. What about that? Boom, there it is. Oh, thank you. And you just come in. And all of a sudden, and then you just turn it over and turn it over and turn it over. And pretty soon it starts to grow. And pretty soon it starts to be part of it. And then you just start worshiping God. Because, oh, God, you're awesome. You're awesome that you would provide this that this is reality. And then you just kind of dwell on a bit. And then you get out to get gas somewhere and somebody's standing there going, oh, it's awful hot out here. And all of a sudden, you open your mouth and just gospel comes out. You know? And, and you, you just like, you have to call somebody to talk about it. You know? It's like, who can I call? You're not going to call somebody. Did you know? You know? And you just start preaching. You know? And my kids can always tell them when I'm on the road because they'll keep, they start getting texts from me. You know, it's like, do this, do that, get this done, do that. And they're like, they wrote back and said, you're on the road, aren't you? Because <laughs> they know. Not that I would text while I drive. I'm not saying that. But <laughs> Make a mark. We need to edit this part of the tape later. So <laughs> now, I told you, I'm just like you. <laughs> now, he says, having made no... Now, listen carefully. See, the bottom line with all this stuff is you just have to take the words that I'm reading to you that are scripture and just say, this is truth. That's right. It's a fact right now. It's real. There's no ifs, ands, or, uh, or buts about it. This is just it. This is just truth. Right? You just take it. You read it. Okay, that's a fact. This is a fact. That's a fact. Okay. It is a fact that he has abandoned toward me in all wisdom. That's a fact. That's, that's it. There's no question about it. He has done that. So there it is. In verse 9, having made known unto us. So something here has already happened. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. You hear that? People say, oh, I just wish I knew the will of God. You do. You just don't know you know it. Because you have it in here. It's there. It's the mystery of his will. But it's made known. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. You hear that? He did it in himself. It, it wasn't because you're so good. It wasn't your talents. It wasn't because you're a good singer, speaker. You know, you, you've, anything about you is because it pleased him. It was for his purpose. It works for his benefit. He did it because he wanted it done. Amen. Right? And, he, and you're just, you know, fortunate enough 
that you were there. And he said, oh, look, there you are. I'll just use you. Right? It wasn't because you were so great. He didn't, he didn't look through 10,000 people to find you and said, oh, you're the one. No. He said, anybody, whosoever. You said, I accept you. He said, good. Here, boom, everything in you. <clears throat> According to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So he's pulling all of us together. He's putting us in himself. In whom? Also, we have obtained an inheritance, being, now listen, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. In other words, see, we always look at that and go, oh, and when we read something about his will or the counsel of his will, we always think it's arbitrary. Oh, this has to do with he's doing this or he's going to do that. He's not saying that at all. He's saying what he has done, he has pulled us all together in him. He has done all this, that we have obtained an inheritance here. It was his will that we have an, an, an inheritance. It was his will that he predestinated us, right, to, to walk according to his purpose, right? And it was all about what he wants to get done, and that's why he did it. It's not some arbitrary thing. Well, what's God's will for your life? Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to find the will of God. For... The will of God is extremely simple and extremely easy to find for your life. Love God, love your neighbor, do to others as you would have done to you. Anything that falls in that category is God's will for your life. Right? You want me to, I've told people this before, and I'm probably have to tell it kind of quick. How many of you believe, or maybe I should probably have to ask this first before I just make a statement. How many of you believe that it's true that God called me to the ministry? You believe that? Okay. Do you believe I'm as far as you know, I'm fulfilling my ministry. Would you, would you say that? Okay. I mean, because you don't know for sure, probably, but okay. But you do believe I'm called of God and I'm doing God's will. Right? Okay. Because if you don't, you shouldn't be sitting here listening. Okay. It's pretty simple. Okay. Now, do you want me to tell you how I received the call of God to, to the ministry? You sure? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to tell you about when I got hit by the car and dedicated to God by my mom and all that stuff. You already know about most of that. But I was in the military, and God started dealing with me. I felt. He dealt with me. He wanted me to go into the ministry. So when I got out of the military, I started heading that direction. At that time, I was really Southern Baptist. You know, I had been around Pentecostal, but I had never received the baptism of the Spirit, spoken to the tongues, and that stuff. And that was just, you know, pretty much... Southern Baptist, and then I ended up going to a missionary Baptist church, and at that time, having come out of the military, all I could have in the military was a mustache, you know, no beard or anything like that, and the mustache had to be even with the lips and, you know, certain requirements, and I went to this pastor and said, I believe God's called me to the ministry, and the pastor said, well, if God has really called you to the ministry, then why do you still have a mustache, because God can't use you with a mustache, <laughs> so I walked out of that church and never went back. And I said, if, if, if my mustache is more powerful than God, which I knew wasn't true, and that made me know that that preacher wasn't true, so I never went back there. And so I was still teaching martial arts at the time, and that was my career, that was my, where I made my income. And then at one point, I felt like God wanted me to get out of the martial arts, so I got out, and I had a background in fast food and restaurant management and that kind of thing. And so... I was uh, an assistant manager, basically, I was a uh, restaurant training coordinator at a restaurant, and God, I felt like God was dealing with me about preaching. And so one day I sat down, and I said, you know, I didn't know anything about a lot of this different stuff, you know, being led by the Spirit and all that. I didn't understand any of that stuff. And I said, okay, should I, do the, should I go into ministry, should I not? And I sat down, and I said, okay, if I went to, I lived in Texas, I said, if I went to the Texas Employment Commission, if I was looking for a job, I would go in, I would sit down, they would let me fill out a bunch of stuff, and they would try to find, you know, are you a people person, are you a, a you know, a desk person, 
You know, would you rather deal with people or deal with paper? You know, would you rather be a frontline person or would you rather be clerical? And they would try to find the place where I fit best, the place that I enjoyed working. You know, do I like working with numbers? Do I like working with people? That kind of thing. And they would put me through all this stuff and then they would try to find a, a place, a, a job out there that said, okay, we want to put you there and you go try interview and all that and see if it's a good fit. So they would try to, they would try to find the best place that I could go where I could, where I would enjoy being there and the people wanted me there. You know, because if you enjoy doing it, you'll last a while. They wouldn't, they don't want to put a people person in an office job where you're never dealing with people because you'll be miserable and you're not going to last. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, so if God wanted, if, if I went to the employment commission, they would put me through this battery of tests and then they would have me, you know, figure out where I would be best and they would send me that job. I said, okay, so I'd, I'd already read some of Charles Finney's material and I remembered him saying that a Christian, to be a Christian, you have to dedicate yourself to the greatest good of the universe and you have to dedicate yourself to do the will of God. And you had to go where you could do the most good for the most people for the longest time that's, that is the will of God. So I sat down and I said, okay, doing what I'm doing in a restaurant. I got the restaurant, I got the ministry. Which one can I do the most good for the most people for the longest time and it be in the will of God? And I said, that's ministry, right? I feed people food, they're good for a meal. A few hours later, they're hungry again. I can only help a few people that come into the restaurant. If I'm in ministry, I can help more people, e eternity. And I said, God wants me in ministry. Now, I was a Baptist, I didn't know anything about this other stuff. And so I got up, went out, checked on some Bible schools, my dad actually said, we'll put you through seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, and that's what they were gonna do. And I told him, I don't have time for that. And he said, if you don't go to school, nobody's gonna let you preach in their church. I said, I'm not trying to get in their church. I need to be on the street. We need to talk to people. We need to get people saved. And my dad said, well, you're not going about it right. You know, there's a process. <laughs> and I said, not for what I'm doing. And so I did get some of the books. I found some of the places, and that's when I started going to the Full Gospel Church, and that's when I got my first Copeland tape, my first Kenyon book, and, and not saying I agree with everything either one of them say, but it was a good start. And I got headed in that direction, and then I started studying, and then I heard about Dr. Simron. I heard about his Bible school. And then I wanted to go up there. At, well, at one point, I was wanting to go to Bible school, so I started getting all the information about Bible schools and I couldn't go because I didn't have the money to go and pay tuition and do that stuff. So I, I called the schools and found out what books they use. And when I got their list of textbooks, then I started buying the textbooks and I started studying it myself. And then when I, they, I had to study Greek and, well, partial Hebrew, I didn't really go into Hebrew. But whenever I, I knew that the New Testament was written in Greek, so I got a hold of Greek text and taught myself Greek and got their books and taught myself Greek. and. Went into it where I, and you know, wasn't comfortable total translation, but I could understand it. And so then, over a period of time, actually, finally, Dr. S met Dr. Summerall down in Houston, Texas, at John Osteen's church. And at one point, I snuck into a minister's meeting. I wasn't ordained, wasn't a minister, but they didn't check credentials, so I snuck in. And I'm sitting there, and they started asking questions. I mean, you know, it's funny because they had this long table up on this platform. It had all these guys sitting behind it. It had T.L. Osborne, Dr. Summerall, John Osteen, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other guys. Those are the main guys that were there. Uh, Copeland was there, actually. And there were several other, several other people that were there. And you know, you could sit there right from where I was sitting. You see these guys sitting behind this table and it looked like the Last Supper. You know, you had all the greats that were there. You know? And so we got to ask questions and people were asking this question of T.L. Osborne and this person question from different people. So finally I got enough guts, you know, I was afraid to raise my hand because I thought they might say, who are you, are you a minister, are you a you know, licensed ordained, all that stuff. But I finally got up enough nerve and raised my hand. I asked Dr. Summerall, I said, this is a question for Dr. Summerall. Asked him a question and he said, when he, he answered the question, pretty direct, and he said, how soon can you get to South Bend? And I said, uh, so, you know, as quick as I can get back home and get there, I'll get there. Well, when you get there, come see me. That was it. 
meeting was over, I walked out. My wife, kids, my mom and dad were in the meeting. <clears throat> I went over to my wife and I said, I'm going to South Bend. And she said, why? She, <laughs> not what, but why? Okay. She was used to that kind of stuff. You know, just jump up and go. <clears throat> and I said, Lester Summerall said to come see him. And she said, well, okay. So then whenever I left him up there, I didn't have everything to go. We didn't have the money to go. We were, it was not good. And so my wife and my kids stayed with my sister-in-law, and I got on a bus, and I rode to South Bend. And then I got on a city bus and rode across to Ireland Road. And I got off that bus with a duffel bag and my backpack. I walked in the church, walked up, walked in the front door. And when I walked with her, I said, I'm here to see Dr. Summerall. And she said, do you have an appointment? I said, no, but he's expecting me. And she said, okay, down the hall, second door on your right. Yeah, I walked down, knocked on the door, heard his voice, come in. So I opened the door and walked in, and there was a long hall, I mean, it was a long office. You know, it wasn't square, it was long. One end was his desk, the other end was his chair, and had all this stuff all around it, and a couch. I'm standing there, and he's writing. Sitting, he's sitting on his desk and writing down. Before I had left, and the big question in my heart, was always really two questions. <clears throat> how do I know the will of God? And how do I know when I'm being led by the Spirit? That was the big deal. I figured if I knew the will of God, how to tell what the will of God was. And if I knew how to know when I'm being led by the Spirit, I figured everything else would work out. You know, if I knew those two things. And I told my wife, I said, my, my life quest is to figure out, because I thought it was some deep, hard secret to figure out, which apparently to most Christians it is. <clears throat> and I said, I will, I'm going to spend my time trying to figure out these two things. So I go in, I'm standing there in Dr. Simrall's office, got my stuff, I'm standing there. And he's writing. <clears throat> and I'm just kind of looking around at all the stuff on his walls and pictures and stuff. And he writing, and he stops, looks up. To know the will of God, read the Bible. To be led by the Spirit, do the Bible. Yeah. I'm just standing here like, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I guess I can go back home. I have found what, I've heard what I'm looking for. And I really, I, I'm, I was really torn. I'm like, do, do I leave? Is that, is that it? You know? And then we talked a bit more and then I actually ended up, well, I went and got a job. I ended up detasseling corn. You know what that is? That is not a fun job. Okay, first time I had ever done it. My hands were so raw because we had to get on these machines and ride through the middle and you have to grab them with the bottom part of your hand and rip the tassels off and going through. Horrible job, okay? <clears throat> but I had to raise money and get an apartment. I had to get a car. I didn't have a car. I had nothing. And I had to get a car, an apartment and everything so I'd go back and get my family and bring them up. And I did that for the whole summer. <clears throat> got an apartment <clears throat> and then got this rundown car <laughs> that was, I'm glad I didn't have to drive it to Texas because it wouldn't have made it. At one point it ran out of, the brakes went out in South Bend snow and I had to, <laughs> the brakes were out for about three weeks and I had to drive it every day. <clears throat> so to slow down you had to kick it in neutral and get up against the curb and let the curb slow you down. <laughs> I was driving by faith. <laughs> okay? I'm not kidding. <laughs> See, you ought to be glad my wife didn't come up. She'd come up, I couldn't tell you the story. She'd be back there going, I mean, <laughs> she doesn't like everybody know this part. <laughs> okay? But <clears throat> then finally I got back down and got my family, brought them up. <clears throat> and I'll never forget because by then I had, I told Dr. Summerall, all of them, I said, I'm, I'm here. Whatever you want me to do, I'm working, but anytime I'm off, I'm here. And I would get there and I would do whatever they needed to do. I became an usher. Whatever needed to be done, I did it. <clears throat> and so finally when I got my family up there, then they needed some prayer warriors on their telephone lines. And so they couldn't get anybody to work nights, 11 to 7. So I jumped in there and I volunteered me and my wife to do it. And mainly on the weekends. And so we would go up there late at night, get in there about 10.30, a little room. And the room was off the side, so we had pews over here right outside the door, that were in the main sanctuary. Dr. Summerall's pulpit was here, <clears throat> pews were right there, and then the prayer room was on the side. And we would take our kids and put them on the pews so they could sleep. 
and we'd lay them out there and they would sleep there and then we'd be in that room so if, we, if they cried or something we could hear them and we would answer phones all night in the prayer lines. People started calling in. That was the first time I ever had a pure miracle from somebody that wasn't part of my family because a man called in and had heart problems. We prayed. He called back the next week and said the doctor said he had a new heart. So that was, you know, a victory. So we, and the thing is that we would do that on Saturday night and early uh, 7 o'clock Sunday morning some of the people started coming in. But we already had our places because I had kids. <laughs> we had our kids marking our spots, you know. <clears throat> so we'd go in there and take them into the nursery and then <clears throat> we would be right on the front. And I always said I was close enough that if Dr. Summerall spit, I got hit with holy water, <laughs> okay? It was that close. And <clears throat> but I would watch him, and if he needed something, I would, I would do it. You know, if I saw he was looking for something, I'd, I'd Doctor, what do you need? Uh, can't find my, my water. Where's my water? And I'd, I'd get it. You know, just anything, because I wanted to be as close to him as I could get. And so I was watching him, and then he, when he finished, he would always walk down. <clears throat> and as soon as he walked past, my wife knew, I'm gone. I'm right behind him. I'm, I'm following in his wake. <laughs> right? And I would listen. He would start. I mean, if he stopped quick, I'd run into him. I was right there, okay? People would ask him questions and I would listen. And I was always just trying to just glean whatever I could. And then at one point I was gonna to go to his Bible school and I just didn't have the money for it and I didn't want to tell him I didn't have the money so I just learned as much as I could and got around and then <clears throat> we would do the uh, prayer, the prayer lines at night. And I'll never forget because the church had this double doors, you go in, they had this huge map on the wall and a light pointing down at it that said, untold billions yet untold. And about 4.30 in the morning, every morning of the week, first time I heard this noise going on. So I'm sneaking around. It's all dark, except for this light on the thing. I'm sneaking around, you know, because I've been involved in security and martial arts. And stuff. You know, it's not a good area. I'm thinking somebody's breaking into the church. So I'm sneaking around behind the pillars and looking, trying to find who it is. And I walk around this corner, and there's Dr. Sumrall. 4.30 in the morning, perfect suit, tie. I mean, just perfectly dressed. That's one of the things you'll notice. If you study the lives of God's generals, every one of them were always impeccably dressed, right? Not, not rich, not fancy dressed, just always perfect. It was amazing. I, it's one of the things I'd noticed. But, well, so I'm watching him, and I'm kind of hiding behind this pillar, and I was going to step out, but he's walking around praying. And that light shone down, and it made a circle on the floor, so he's just kind of walking back and forth. And so I'm just watching him, and he starts praying, and... I'm trying to listen, and finally, I did this for a couple of days, actually. You know, every morning, he would start coming in, I'd go up there and sneak up and listen to him. Because you learn a lot about a man when you listen to him pray, whenever he doesn't think anybody's listening. <clears throat> and it was so funny, because he'd, he'd be walking, he'd stop me and say, that uprising in the Congo, it's going to stop. That revolution, that stops. That, that president's a good man of God. He'll stay in power. And just keep on walking. I'm like... It was amazing. It's like this man was playing chess with the world. You know, it was just, and he actually believed when he prayed that a king would stay in power, they would stay in power. And they did. And so he would walk around and say these things. And then finally one day I was standing there and I was watching him, you know, and he's walking back and forth. And he goes, Well, you're going to come out here and pray? You're going to hide out in the shadows. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm too late. I can't sneak back. You know, I can't get away. <laughs> so I decided to come on out. And so I start walking. And you know, he, he, you ought to, I don't know if you know or not, when somebody's walking around in a circle, it's hard to avoid them. It's, because you'll start walking, and a minute you're, you're walking around, and all of a sudden, oop, there they are, get out of the way. There you go. He walks past, and you walk, and then you try to get behind him, but that feels weird when you're just following him around. You don't want to bug him. <clears throat> so you're just walking around, and he'd start praying, and finally I'm standing there, and I'm listening to him more than I'm praying, and finally he starts saying, Well, are you going to pray? Pray. You know, and I'm like, I'm sitting there, Father, in Jesus' name, we just going to be, because it's about 4.30 in the morning, you know. I'm like, Father, in Jesus' name, well, if you're going to pray, pray. Father, oh God, in heaven, oh God. You know, I'm trying to pray now, you know. <clears throat> and he just walked around, so we started doing it. And so finally then I started coming up there every morning. I did that for like two years. And that was every morning. And from then, when he'd quit, I'd quit. And then we'd go do whatever else, and he'd be done. And then I'd follow him around and <laughs> just follow him around mainly and eavesdrop on his conversations. <laughs> and for the most part, that was my Bible school, okay? And which is good, because the guys he had teaching his Bible school, I wouldn't want to listen to. Anyway, we, um, <laughs> matter of fact, now they're teaching other Bible schools around the country, so 
I'm not going to tell you where they are, though. <laughs> so, but he, um, just being around him, he knew who he was. He had no doubt about it. He had no questions about it. The thing that stands out about men of God like that, it's not that they try to be bossy or rule over, you know, or they're not trying to throw their weight around. But it's like they speak and they expect it to be done. You know, and if it's a devil that needs to go, they expect him to go. If it's a sickness that needs to be healed, they expect it to be healed. If it's you need to go pick up something, they expect you to go pick it up. It's just that simple. That's just the way it is. Now, in, in us, you've got to develop that way. That was, that was, what was how I got launched out. And we came back home after that. And, that, and th now this was all before I knew anything. I mean, I'd heard of John Lake, but I, I, and I'd been in touch with John Lake's son-in-law and his daughter, or John Lake's daughter. But I didn't know anything about the ministry per se, and I, they hadn't passed the ministry to us or anything. It was just, you know, just in touch with them. And we came back and we started learning more and learning more, and then my first daughter died in 81. That was all happened before then. Then in 87, 89, sorry, Memorial Day 89, my daughter Rebecca fell out of the window, second floor, was dead 45 minutes. And we'd already buried one child, so I picked her up, and all I kept hearing was, you're losing another one. But I've been trained well to watch your mouth. Say what you want to happen. Don't say what has happened. Any fool can say that. You say what you want to happen. And I started walking around with her in my arms and saying, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. She was already dead. There's no doubt. I mean, there's no heartbeat, no breath. Doctors verify she'd been dead 45 minutes. I'm walking around with her, her head back, her arms out, dead. <clears throat> and I just started yelling, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And then finally, took her into the house and set her up against the wall. Dead body, propped her up against the wall. He said, that sounds crazy. Yep. <clears throat> but what's amazing is she's alive today. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Propped her up against that wall after 45 minutes. I got down in front of her and I was yelling, same thing. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. 45 minutes into it, it was like somebody punched her in the stomach. She jerked, it was like those paddles, you know, it was just like the paddles with the defibrillators, because she just jerked, spewed blood all over me, her mouth was full of blood. <clears throat> she opened her eyes and I watched her focus. We went and got some bread and gave it to her and made her eat it. And you say, why did you do that? I don't know why at the time. Well, she said, Daddy, I'm hungry, so maybe that had something to do with it. And so, picked her up then and put her in the car. And she couldn't hold herself up. I drove as fast as I could to the hospital. The whole time she was complaining about her wrist. <clears throat> when we got there, they put her in the hospital and checked her out and verified she'd been dead. <clears throat> Both of her wrists were broke. Her knee was crushed. That's why it was hurting when she was trying to hold up. <clears throat> And that was in 89. Yeah. This was on Memorial Day, which we just had Memorial Day recently. And it's funny because it's weird how a lot of the stuff that happens to us in our family happens on holidays. You know? My first daughter died on Friday the 13th, 1981. We buried her the next day, which was February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. <clears throat> so Valentine's Day doesn't always mean the same. And then Memorial Day, when, that, when it comes around, I think of Becky. <clears throat> and I, and I, I reminded Becky of it. And so <clears throat> I refused. When I buried my first daughter, I refused to bury another child. Right then, I didn't say that. When I stood it, when my first daughter died, we did everything we could. We called everybody. We tried to get somebody to raise her from the dead. And <clears throat> Couldn't get a hold of anybody. And so we stood at that grave, my wife and I, and I said, 
God, there was no man for me when I needed one, but if you will teach me, I will be that man for somebody else. We've done that now for <clears throat> at least seven people. Well, children, but nine total, one of them being my own daughter. <clears throat> but we've seen God bring them back. We've seen amazing things. We've had failures. And the thing is now, the failures hurt more than they ever did before. Because I know we don't have to have failures. And so <clears throat> we... Um, that's what started us on this whole path and then got a hold of Dr. Lake's stuff and one thing kind of led to another. And the amazing thing is though, all this goes back, all these guys, Lake, Wigglesworth, Dr. Summerall, T.L. Osborne, all of them, they all know the same secret. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's it. That's the mystery. That's what was hid from the, from the foundations of this world. How God would be able to live in men. The devil didn't know it. Princes of this world didn't know it. Nobody understood it. And when Jesus died and was resurrected, all of a sudden this new time came into being. And yet the church is insistent on living like a servant instead of living like a son. In Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, Therefore you are no more servants but sons. You know, we are we're sons who serve. Of course we serve. Now, I'm not saying don't serve. But a, a, a servant is like an employee. You're not an employee of the kingdom. The kingdom is your home. It's yours. Your father owns it. You're not an employee. You're not a slave. You're a son. Just like Jesus. A son, a daughter of the almighty God. Amen? Amen? That's who you are. And he tells us, you're, you're never told to walk like a, like a man. You're told to walk like sons of God, holding forth the, wor the word of life. We're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. That's who we are. And it's time for the church to start acting like it, regardless of who doesn't like it. Because I can tell you right away who they work for. Because the whole earth is groaning, waiting for us to show up. Amen. Waiting for us to grow up, show up, manifest, and start exercising Jesus' authority over the situations. Amen? Amen. Y'all got to take a break, right? What, we, what time is it? Time? Is it break time or go home time? Break time. Break. Go to break. <laughs>